Hey, y'all. So we are back with Poly Sinai. It's been forever. It's been like a, a bit of a hiatus. Yeah, like a two, mo- two months or so, I think. Mid-May, maybe? Right. Me and Jared are still friends. You know, it's just he's been really busy, you know? I have. This is episode 11, believe it or not. Wow, okay. So 11 cool. episodes. Um, so let them know where you've been because they know where I be. Um, where have I been? So I went back to Louisiana for a while. Um, from We're both from Louisiana, but I'm from the great metropolis of Lake Charles, Louisiana, uh, which is on the other side of New Orleans. But So I was there for mm, a few weeks or so. But other than that, I've just been here in North Carolina, um, you know, working on this dissertation and, you know, trying to stay cool and all that good stuff. Still. So how long is it till you finish that dissertation? And as grad students, that that's like the question that you just can't. No, I, I don't get offended by it. A lot of people get it's a question that we don't like to answer because usually you don't know until like the last second. But I'm hoping to defend my dissertation in the spring. So fingers crossed. Okay. So if y'all know somebody who hired, hey, you never know who's watching these. You never know. So. I thought since we are all outside now and I don't know, I've been watching the news lately. I'm just seeing like you have every variant from Delta to Lambda of COVID coming out. Right. Somebody said the divine nine of COVID strands. (laughs) I really thought we were out the clear. I mean, if you're vaccinated, you pretty much, you kind of are. It's the people who aren't getting vaccinated that are, you know, going to be in a situation they don't want to be in. Right. And as y'all know, California, well, particularly L.A., they enacted a mask mandate again. And it's because people just aren't getting vaccinated or... Yeah, so it's a combination of both. I mean, in L.A., it's so much variation. So in certain areas, vaccination rates are really high. So I think in like New York, done really well with vaccinations. But in places like where I'm from, Southern Louisiana, I think the vaccination rate is like 30%, if that, um, might even be lower. So when you only have a quarter of the population vaccinated, it kind of defeats the purpose of what we were trying to do. But yeah, I think it's a combination of that. And it's just this variant from what I understand, it's just transmits really, uh, really easily, much more so than the original strand. So there's also that. And speaking of basically states where you are, that's a perfect segue for my question. Like, you know, I just noticed that these COVID numbers are getting really high in red states. And the reason why I'm bringing up all this is what's the political relationship to this? Is it political, you think? Absolutely. So, I mean, from day one, the virus was, there was like a two week period where I think everybody took it serious before it had become politicized. But then after, you know, fight Fox News and all the right wing people started saying that, you know, calling it the China virus and then also saying that, you know, only you remember for, at the beginning, there was this whole like narrative about that black people were more susceptible to getting it. Like there was this whole like racialized right. um, component that I think a lot of white people internalized that and said, well, it doesn't affect them. In fact, I was looking at a clip that someone had shared on Twitter. I think it was from uh, CBS News or something. And one of the people that they were highlighting, either I think was in ICU or was pretty much on her deathbed. And she was like, white woman was, you know, under the impression that this was something that, you know, her color would protect her. And so I think that there are a lot of white people who feel that this doesn't affect them. Or it's also one of those things like, people don't see themselves in statistics. So you can read all of the numbers you want, but most people don't, operate under this sense of oh it's going to happen to me it's usually the opposite they overestimate how much immunity they have from something or how impervious they are to something but you know they gonna find out in a minute so (laughs) i mean well what does it say that most of the high numbers are coming from red states particularly though i think it says a couple things well one red states tend to be on average poorer. So not only is, are you gonna have higher infection rates, but you're, you're also gonna have people who don't have access to as good of medical care um, and so on. In fact, I have a, to give you an example, I have a friend who is from rural North Carolina and I mean, rural, like dirt roads, there's one light, that type of situation. And so he was telling me that the closest hospital to like his home is like 40 miles away. And so I was like, well, what do you do if you 
have some type of emergency and you need to be treated quickly if he was like, you die. <laughs> Which isn't funny, but I'm saying all I have to say that not only are Southern states, deep Southern states especially, suffering from a spike in cases, but they're also in areas where people don't have health care and access to medical care is generally poor. So it's kind of a, it's only compounding the issue. So political leaders in the South are going to have to get creative because the message is politicized and I don't know how you get people to, at this point, everyone who wants access to the vac vaccine has it. So it's a matter of what can you do to convince people that they should get vaccinated. I don't Right. And I saw this, um, the governor of Alabama, this old white bitch, <laughs> they asked her like, do you see the numbers in your state? She was like, well, you tell me what to do. Like, <laughs> that's exactly how she sounded. <laughs> like, she just, you just know she's racist. Like, she just sounds racist. But yeah, like they asked her, she was like, well, I tried everything I can do. Uh, what I mean, at this point, it's their fault. But at the same time, she was also one of the governors that opened everything up, like as hospitals were, people were flooding out of the hospitals during like the first wave. So she obviously doesn't give a shit about what's going on in the people. And that type of narrative isn't gonna hurt her because she's in Alabama, which is arguably the most conservative state in America. And she's just saying essentially what people there he want to already believe. They don't have any expectations of their government. So with no expectations, she can say shit. Like if you die, that's on you. Huh. So I saw this conversation on Twitter and it was saying that a lot of Republican figures are worried about the vaccine now and now they're telling their constituents to push it because it's affecting, you know, it may affect their voter turnout. Have you heard that? <laughs> I haven't heard that, but it doesn't shock me. So for Republicans, they only cared about the virus to the extent that it did two things. One, that they could get everything open up again because... I mean, they needed the the, rep, the money. Um, and two, because they didn't want people to, we've talked about, about this before, they didn't want people to realize that the federal government actually had the resources to make sure that people could have a, a decent wage and all of these other things. So they don't want to have to answer to what's going to happen whenever things get really, really bad, which is the way that it's trending that now. So they're trying to save themselves from politically trying to act like they actually take it seriously now, which you can't, this time last year, they were all saying it was a hoax. It was all, it was the flu and all of these other things. And so now they're trying to be serious about it. I don't know if that's going to work either because the people that they're trying to appeal to have been steeped in this crazy messaging for the last year. You can't just do an about face and be like, oh, now you need to go get vaccinated when you spent, when all they've heard on Fox News for the last year is that, you know, it's it's the virus, it's the government's way of like controlling people and all that kind of shit. So, uh, yeah. I can't believe my family still has not taken the vaccine. Like only Nobody? My, only my mom and my uncle, to my knowledge. I, I just can't believe it. What's their, what's their, uh, are they skeptical? What's their hesitation? Um, they don't trust it. It's like because of the whole back in the day with the Tuskegee oh, experiments. People don't. I get it. There is a reason to be cautious. Of, and so I tweeted about this. I was like, there are, I think, legitimate questions about how much power do you want to cede to the state and the federal government and all of those things and forcing people to get vaccinated and all of that. I think there are some legitimate questions that have to be asked, but we also can't, but we just, we've talked about this before, like we just generally don't have a good historical knowledge of like what actually went on during these periods. So there's, it's just a, it ends up just being somewhat of a folklore that's just passed on through generations. But you ask somebody about the Tuskegee experiment, they couldn't tell you hardly anything aside from the government tried to kill black people, which it's not <laughs> really what happened. But yeah, I don't know how you combat that either. It's just how you, when people have that type of narrative so ingrained or ingratiated, I should say, in, in kind of the way that they understand the world, it's hard to just change that overnight. The crazy thing is I was talking to another friend of mine who's in, um, she just finished medical school and she's currently doing a residency. And she was saying that when we had the winter peak um, and the numbers were like through the roof, she was saying that a lot of people would come to the ICU, obviously with COVID and essentially they would be like, I don't have COVID. I don't care what you tell me. Like, I don't have it. And so she was like, well, we can't like do anything 
get force them to put this oxygen mask on. And so she would essentially have to ask them before time. They're like, okay, so you have COVID, which means you're probably going to not be able to breathe in your own in a very short amount of time. Do you want oxygen whenever that happens? And they're like, yes. Even though they just said like two minutes ago, they didn't have COVID. It just goes to show like people have, it's what we call in, in social psychology, motivated reasoning. When people create it's essentially reinforce what they want to believe despite all of the evidence but how do you combat that right so on the topic of incentives for people to get the vaccine i saw in france that they're doing like stricter guidelines for the vaccines like now you can't go to restaurants you can't go to movie theaters they're gonna you know concerts nightclubs it's like okay, so you don't want to take the vaccine, then you will stay home. And I'm thinking that's a great idea. And I think there's people like um, protesting it now, but I think the United States should adopt that practice. But a good question you posed, because I was trying to see how to frame that question is, how much power should the state, federal government, have to police human behavior? I think this is a great question. And I think it's one that we don't talk about enough. So I'm not in what we call an anti-status. So I'm not anti the federal government. I believe that we have to have some forms of regulation whenever you live in a country of 330 million people, if everyone is just left to their own devices without at least some organizing principles or under organized understanding of how people should be behaving, it would be, I think, chaotic. So I do think that there needs to be some type of centralization. Um, that being said, the way that people are just being like, lock us up again, like, we know that generally once you give up some of your privileges or freedoms um, that you once had, I'm, this sounds very Republican because it's kind of a Republican talking point, like, which, oh, if you give too much power to the government, this next thing you know, we're going to be the Soviet Union circa 1950. So that's always the, that's the conservative talking point. But I do think part of the reason that the conservative reasoning is so appealing to a lot of people is because in some ways, like, we really don't want to be in a situation where we have to rely on the federal government to make every decision for our well-being, safety, and, and so forth. That being said, like, I think it's complicated because the decisions that some people make can have profound consequences for other people. And it can, that's what happens when you live in a society. Like, we don't make decisions in a vacuum. So if your ass decides not to get vaccinated, and I have a kid that's, you know, 10 or 11 who hasn't had a chance to get vaccinated yet, there's a threat there <laughs> to other people. And so the vaccine isn't just necessarily about you. And so I do think that that gets into a tricky question about, okay, well, if we know that something like getting vaccinated is something that doesn't just implicate the person, but it could actually affect other people, well, who do we get to mediate that and make sure that there's some type of way that, that people comply with that? And I think that's an open question. But to just to be like, oh, the government should just, you know, do this, 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 and that. I'm like, part of democracy is us collectively determining what we think needs to happen, not just being like, just let the, the government handle it and I'm just going to go on so I do think there's a political question there that people should think a little bit more critically about. Would you be for enforcing it if it was for a vote? Uh, oh, that's a good question. I would need to know what's, what, what are the consequences for it's not It's never yes or no with you, is it? Never. But so think about it this way. Um, what are the, I need to know what the consequences are for not complying. And so we know that one thing that although we know that poor white people in certain areas are kind of not on the vaccine bandwagon. We also know that there's a lot, there's a, a lot of variation in who gets the vaccine based upon their educational background, their socioeconomic status and stuff with poor people being much more, um, are much less inclined to get the vaccine. Now, why that is, is an open, you know, there's plenty of people doing research on that and I'm not an expert on that, but if we think about consequences then, what does it mean that most of the people who haven't gotten vaccinated are poor people who are generally more likely to face some types of punitive actions from the state as it is? So do we wanna police them even further? Like it just, again, it goes back to this question about what types of things are we okay with the state doing? Um, and do we really want more policing? Um, I think we should be nudging away from the security state, not creating more instances of it. So if it came up for a vote, I need to know a lot of things. I need to know what the consequences were. If you 
I mean, is it fine? Like, what is, what's the legal ramifications of that? Mm -hmm. um, I need to know, like, who's enforcing these things because if it's the police, like, I don't want to give the police more power than, power than they already have. So I can't say yes or no. I need to know. I would need to know. I couldn't answer this hypothetical. <laughs> Well, for me, I would vote yes, because, I mean, you need to have a driver's license to drive. I mean, that's something that's enforced. Like, you, you need to have a license to drive. So I just feel like, you know, you should take the vaccine or, you know, no one's forcing you to take it, but the less places you can go if you don't have it, and that's up to you. So that's what I feel like. So when you say no one's enforcing it, are you saying a situation where businesses had the right to turn away people based on their vaccination status? Because I think that's a diff slightly different question than saying, should you have to carry your card around and if someone stops you in the street and you get, you know, where's your paper? Like, so I think well, it just, again, it depends on what the terms of it are. Well, I love what New York was doing. They did this shit for a week. Like, uh, we go to the club and you had to have your vaccination card or scan out in order to go in, you know? And I think it should be like that for a lot of places. If the situation becomes dire and the numbers keep rising, whether or not I voted yes or no for something like that, I it would depend on, I would need to know the nuances of whatever the policy was, because I'm, I don't want to, I'm anti-expanding the security state. So I that's what that would entail. And also, like, do we really want businesses to be able to introduce more ways of, which it is a form of discrimination. So discrimination isn't an inherently bad or a good thing. Discrimination means that you're making, you're differentiating people based on some standard or some idea. So this would be introduced some form of discrimination. Is it a, okay? That's a, again, that's a bigger question. But do we want businesses to have, again, more power than they already have? And so I don't think there's a right or wrong answer, just something to think about. Everything is just so nuanced, you know. As it should be. The, the world, world is complicated. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, I cannot wait to see where we are during the fall. How about that? I right. cannot wait. But um, our next topic is billionaires in outer space. This, this is crazy to me. Like, are, are they using their own money? And how did this come to be? Is there, like, any facts or just some, like, a billionaire was like, oh, I'm just bored. I want to go to outer space. That was my impression. So I'm sure they'll, they'll come up with some type of way to justify this whole situation. But I did see on, I think it was on Good Morning America, Robin Roberts was uh, interviewing someone with, person with NASA, or like a higher ranking official, I think who was really involved in the planning and all that. And she was like, you know, there's some people who say that of all the things going on in the world, like, why is a handful of rich people going to space? Why are we spending money and spending resources on this type of thing? And the guy gave such a weird answer. He was a black man and was like, well, you know, Robin, I don't think that's exactly fair because think about there might be one little black boy who might see this and that would be one less black boy who's out here in the street getting in trouble or something crazy like that. And I was just like, wait, how did, what, this whole, no, that's not how any of this works. Um, and so they're trying to spin this into, oh, well, going into space, it just instills so much hope in people and it opens their eyes to a whole new frontier and all that bullshit. So this is just a situation where billionaires are doing whatever the fuck they want because they know that they're rich and can do whatever the fuck they want. And they like to dangle that in our faces. And so they can try to paper over that, but that's really what's going on here. And they're, they're fully funding it themselves. I'm not sure about the funding scheme. I want to say yes, but don't quote me on that. I see a lot of people spinning it as like, oh, well, you see the billionaires going into space. So maybe one day regular people can have space travel as leisure. We have way too many fish to fry on Earth. So we don't even need to be talking about that, to be completely honest. Mm -hmm. I know you're not in the pop culture, but did you hear like, about um, Lil Uzi Vert like buying a planet? I didn't hear about this. Yeah, Wait, uh, according to Elon Musk's wife or girlfriend probably wife she said that little uzi is like in the process of purchasing a planet i know right and i'm um, like i f i personally believe that there's life outside of earth and i'm just thinking what if somebody on jupiter was like oh i purchased earth let me go to earth and like see the planet that i bought you know it's just really weird 
was that the plot of Independence Day? Like, I, don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's just, yeah, you're right. It's just so much serious things going on. Hunger, like the virus. Shot by the, police, the, the fires in California where have there's smoke all the way on the East Coast. Like, there's just way other big things. There are way other bigger fish to fry. We always just be worried about the wrong shit. I mean, humanity collectively is not smart. Air observation. <laughs> and then the environment. I feel like the the weather has been crazy. Did you hear about the whole smoke situation? It, y'all didn't have haze in New York? We did. I was so, wondering about that. So the haze actually is smoke from fires, that there were wildfires in California. So from everywhere from like northern Canada all the way down to North Carolina, we even had haze in like an air quality alert here. It literally traveled across oh the country. Oh my God, I was wondering that. Smoke from wildfires induced by climate change. <laughs> oh man, see that's why I'm just trying to live every day, <laughs> like, you know, just enjoy life. <laughs> anyway, can you remind everyone why you hate billionaires and why there shouldn't be any? I think they just need a reminder about that. We have an episode about it, but you can just find us. So first and foremost, Nobody can earn a billion dollars. So let's just lay that to rest. Because every time I post about billionaires, somebody hops in my mentions or comments in my Facebook posts and be like, well, so-and-so earned that. And I'm just like, how do you earn $90 billion? I physically want to see this in, in happening. It, it doesn't. It cannot happen. You cannot amass that amount of wealth without exploiting other people, without exploiting the environment, without exploiting all types of, uh, of institutions. And so the reason I have an issue with billionaires is not only the wealth, although that is a problem, but also because they hold such an inordinate amount of power. Um, and that is a big part. We know that billionaires are often really involved in crafting policy because they fund all of these think tanks and pay for all these lobbyists and all of those things. So they disproportionately get to set the agenda of what happens in this country. So no surprise, a lot of billionaires like the Koch brothers, one of them is dead, but one of them still alive. He is made his fortunes because of oil. He's anti-climate change. So he funds all types of ventures to essentially uh, undermine any types of legislation that might address climate change. Um, he'll fund candidates to run against candidates who are pro climate change. And so this is the type, type of stuff that you can do when you have that much money, that much power, that much access to the, 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 the power systems. And so more than anything else, billionaires make our country less dis- democratic because if a handful of people can disproportionately call the shots, then that's not democracy. Because de- democracy means that we should all be able to collectively, equally contribute to whatever decisions that are being made. And that's not happening with billionaires. And I don't give a shit how much they donate to charity. Did you hear that um, I think LeBron James is the newest billionaire? Like he's made $300 million in the NBA, and then he's made $700 million in endorsements. I did see that. I don't, so I remember when Jay-Z became a billionaire like five or six years ago, whenever it was. And I just tweeted, I was like, I don't, I don't give a shit that Jay-Z is a billionaire. And people like jumped all on me and were like, this is a black man. Think about how many people he inspires. I'm like, he could inspire a lot of people more if he just liquidated his wealth and gave it away. But he's not going to do that. And I'm not saying that he has to do that. I mean, I would like him to do that. But I just think that one thing that is really concerning is that when we think somebody like we being black people think that somebody like LeBron James becomes becoming a billionaire is somehow uplifting the black community. It is uplifting LeBron James and his family. Okay. But that isn't justice. And so that is another reason that I get annoyed with specifically when we have black billionaires or black people who ascend to, you know, these, these, these lofty ranks of of our society, because then we think that this is evidence that, oh, there's, you know, we're all good. Like this is lifting the, it was just like, it's not, no, LeBron James winning is not helping me win anything. So Mm -hmm. I still got to pay for shit. Moral of the story, um, eat the rich. (laughs) Yes. And and one other thing, because I know someone's going to say it, 
Well, they give so much, they donate so much to charity and they do so many great things. My book recommendation for today, well, you can talk about it, is called No Such Thing as a Free Gift. And in that book, the author shows how, number one, billionaires and super wealthy people give far less to charity than do poor and working people relative to their income and their wealth. So even though they might be dropping a million dollars here or a million dollars there, a million dollars compared to a billion is not anything. That's like me giving ten dollars to some charity, and so number one, they're not more generous. So that nip that in the bud. And two, she shows how, like what I was saying earlier, that oftentimes because they're so wealthy, them being billionaires, they have all of this, these foundations and things. And part of the reason they have them is because they know that a lot of these organizations need the money, so they're willing to, for instance, like. Michael Bloomberg was one of the big donors for Stacey Abrams' like get out the vote situation in Georgia, which one more person might say that, you know, it was money. We needed the money to win Georgia. So if it's coming from Bloomberg or anybody else, like what's it matter? But what's it mean is that Bloomberg always will get a seat at the table. And do you really always want these types of people with a seat at the table? Because they have their own prerogatives and because they have so much power, they can push those prerogatives to the to the top of the heap. And so I just think that billionaires make America much less democratic. And if we're trying to become more democratic, we need to stave off against that. Well said. Uh, what's the name of the book again and who wrote it? So the name of the book is called No Such Thing as a Free Gift, The Gates Foundation and the Price of Philanthrop Philanthropy. And the name of the author is Lindsay Magui. Okay. Well, y'all... Wow, that went by fast. Jeez. <laughs> that is the end of our uh, time, but we'll be back soon, I believe. But let them know where they can find you. Yes. So I can be found on Twitter, JC Tiger Fan. That's J A Y C Tiger Fan. Um, also Instagram, too. Yeah. And we won't be back next week because we will both be in Palm Springs to celebrate me. Mm, yeah. I also want to tell everyone in the chat that please let us know what do you want us to talk about? Give us some topic ideas. I think I would love that. Please hit me up in my inbox. Y'all know me, C-D-I-G-G-I-1. Thank y'all for tuning in to Poly Side Eye, and we'll be back soon. Hopefully. <laughs> Alrighty. Bye, y'all.